There's some sneaky foods out there. They're disguised as happy, healthy foods. And on the surface they are. And they have great micronutrient profiles and they are good for you. But they have a dark side. They're higher glycemic than you think. And they might contribute to an insulin spike more than you think. And if you eat a bunch of them, it may even contribute to insulin resistance. Is this fear mongering? No, it's a reality. Okay, just like every rose has its thorn, haha, <laughs> you have food that is not always what it seems. But don't take everything to the bank entirely. I'm gonna to try to make that clear because I don't wanna demonize foods, but I just want you to be aware of why certain things might elicit different blood sugar responses. Every single food that I'm talking about today is a food that I have verified doing this to me at some level when I wear a continuous glucose monitor. So it's not just me looking at the research, I also take my own anecdotal experience because that's how I run my channel. If I don't notice it with me, I don't usually talk about it as much either. Okay, so dumping into the first one, sneaky, sneaky parsnips. So parsnips are awesome, okay? They are super nutritious, nutrient dense. They have a lot of antioxidants, but that doesn't mean that they don't spike your insulin, right? Okay, so with parsnips, we're talking one cup having about 24 grams of carbs. They're just very deceiving because they're pretty high glycemic in the world of vegetables. Okay, usually we're looking like around a 50 to 55 glycemic index scale, which doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you consider that honey is a 58 and maple syrup is around a 54, you realize, wow, for a vegetable, this is pretty darn sneaky, okay? Now, a pretty well-known academia lady, Teresa Fung, had even mentioned, and I'll quote, it makes more sense to put them in the same category as bread, rice, or pasta, referring to pretty much all root vegetables, but specifically talking about parsnips. The funny thing is, I have a personal story with parsnips. My wife and I always joke about it. Like, every time we're at the grocery store and we see parsnips, we like kind of point to them, we're like, sneaky, sneaky parsnips. And we call them sneaky, sneaky parsnips because one time I was on a keto diet and I was really watching my carbs and my wife made like a soup that had some parsnip puree in it. And I noticed I got kicked out of keto and it was like, and whether you're keto or not, this is just, the point is, is that it spiked my blood sugar. I'm like, what the heck's going on? So we researched it and like, oh, no wonder, sneaky, sneaky parsnips. Anyway, moving on, the next one, instant oatmeal, not regular oatmeal. You see, I am not the biggest carb guy. Like those of you that watch my channel know that I'm kind of a proponent of a lower carb lifestyle just in general but I don't discount the benefits that come with certain foods like oats, right? Like for example, I talk about heating oats, like heat them up and then let them cool and you get a lot of benefits. It's called a retrograded starch, okay? Because it's basically uh, the starch chains kind of cool off and they become resistant, so it's harder to digest them. So you don't have as big of a blood glucose spike, but oats have a bunch of benefits, right? Okay, they have beta glucans in them. So it's tremendous for the gut microbiome, a lot of soluble fiber, okay? Really a good food overall. They're not that high on the glycemic index scale compared to some cereals. They're around a 50 to 55. But here's what's wild about instant oats. We're talking more like an 80 to 90 glycemic index scale. Why? Because the starch chains get pulverized when they break down the oats into more of an instant form. They basically instantize them, which basically makes it so they're more porous and more expanded already. So when you add hot water, they cook faster. So that means you have an extra high glycemic oatmeal, extra high glycemic food, not to mention the maple and brown sugar flavor or the peaches and cream that you're adding to it that's gonna make it even more sweet. So it's a very sneaky food. If you're gonna have oats, make your own with rolled oats or sprouted oats. And if you really wanna make it good, let them cool down and eat them cold. Not exactly appetizing, but they do work. The next one in the same category is, this is weird, ramen noodles. Here's what's funny about ramen noodles. Super low calorie, so yes, you can lose weight with them, okay? Like, you could definitely lose weight. Anyone that paid their way through college has probably lived on the ramen diet and eating ramen more than two, three, four, five times per week, right? Okay, I get it. But there's an interesting thing that happens with ramen noodles. So the noodles have starch chains in them, right? It's a starch chain that's relatively low glycemic when it's in its normal form. But then you add it to boiling water or hot water, and what happens is those starches swell. And when they swell, then they burst. And when they burst, they explode their little glucose molecules everywhere. So now, instead of having a starch chain that your body breaks down into polysac from polysaccharides into monosaccharides, disaccharides, breaks them down, now you have individual glucose molecules that can spike your insulin significantly. And even the glucose goes into the broth. So then, yes, you are putting yourself potentially at risk for 
a high insulin food. If that's something that you're concerned with, a high glucose, high insulin spiking food. Okay, so then there was a study that was published in the journal Nutrition that took a look at over 10,000 Koreans, 10,700 Korean people. Okay, and it took a look at what they ate. What they found is that those that consumed instant noodles two times per week had a higher prevalence of metabolic syndrome, which is like insulin resistance, uh, high blood pressure, a number of other different things when it comes down to like metabolic dysfunction and mitochondrial dysfunction. Okay, well, correlation does not equal causation. We cannot say just because we look at that data that this is exactly what's going on. But when we do factor in what can happen when you're consuming a lot of noodles, it's probably something to be aware of. But again, don't get me wrong. Like, if eating some ramen noodles means that you're going to trim a thousand calories off your diet, I, I, who am I to say don't do that? Okay, I still want you to have success with your overall diet. Just be aware of things that can be sneaky that you wouldn't think are as crazy and bad. Uh, today's video is sponsored, by the way, by Thrive Market. And I say this because it makes sense. If you've never had cognac noodles before or shirataki noodles and made soup with those noodles, then you haven't lived. It is a completely different taste, but it is so unbelievably good. You can take regular like bone broth or regular miso broth and add shirataki noodles to it. And shirataki noodles are made with what is called cognac root or glucoman and fiber. So practically no blood glucose spike at all practically no calories, in fact, literally we'll say zero or five calories. Really interesting, it's made from a root of the cognac root, so it's really cool stuff. I just say that just because I know Thrive Market has that kind of stuff. They have specific miracle noodles and shirataki noodles, so definitely check them out. So Thrive Market's an online grocery store. You can get all your stuff delivered to your doorstep, super easy. You can save 25% off your initial grocery order by using my special link down below. And also you get a free gift when you use the link down below. So if you're trying to just find more foods that are just maybe less high glycemic that fit within the parameters of what you're doing, trust me, just check it out. Okay, they're all about better for you options. That link is down below in the description. Make sure you check them out. This next one probably isn't gonna come as a surprise, but there's some relatively interesting science that came out of the journal Cell Metabolism that I wanna talk about that may take some people by surprise. Okay, so this one is juice, like fruit juices. No real surprise, we know that juice is just going to be concentrated sugar from the fruit without the actual fiber to slow down the digestion, okay? But let's look at the data a little bit more. So there's a study that was published in the journal Diabetes Care. It took a look at 71,000 nurses, followed them along for quite a period of time. Okay, and it found after a number of years, about 4,500 of them had become diabetic. Okay, well what was interesting is that those that had one glass of fruit juice per day had twice the risk of becoming diabetic. Okay, correlation doesn't equal causation because maybe someone that was consuming a glass of orange juice was also the same kind of person that was having three pieces of toast and having a bunch of other food too, right? So you can't back that data out entirely. But what we have to be aware of is how much sugar is in a glass of fruit juice. Some people will say, well, fruit juice is predominantly fructose, so it's not that big of a deal. Well, this journal cell metabolism study was demonstrating and suggesting that fructose could metabolize into glucose in our small intestine as well as organic acids. So when it gets to our small intestine, it might actually turn into glucose and then absorb, in which case the glucose is still ending up in your bloodstream. And even if fructose ends up in your bloodstream, over the long haul, you don't want huge amounts of fructose in your bloodstream. So this next one is one that I stand the risk of getting destroyed for, but I'm going to make it abundantly clear that this is highly, highly, highly personal, okay? We're talking about artificial sweeteners. Do they spike your blood glucose? Do they contribute to insulin resistance? I can't say that, that's too bold of a claim, but the data is legitimately all over the place. And I mention it because I would be doing a disservice if I did not mention it. Because there have been times when I'm wearing a continuous glucose monitor and I have Splenda or I have sucralose or I have aspartame and my blood sugar drops, indicating I had a big spike in insulin bringing my blood sugar down. Okay, a spike in insulin without the glucose actually there is going to result in my glucose dropping. And I've seen it multiple times, but I've also had situations where it hasn't done a thing. So we need to look at the data and you need to know your body and just be aware of it. 
let it be known that if you were to take me to a party and I was had to choose between a regular Coke and a Diet Coke, first of all, I would choose water. But if I had to choose between those two, I would probably choose a Diet Coke because both are gonna potentially contribute to an insulin issue, potentially, but one is gonna have 150 calories and one's not. So at that rate, I might as well go with the lesser evil. But anyway, that's not the point here. I still feel like you should exercise some caution here with you independently or individually. Now, this isn't happening because artificial sweeteners are spiking your blood glucose. If anything, it's happening because of a possible alteration in metabolic machinery. Maybe it's changing how our cells are actually receiving nutrients. Here's an interesting study. This study was published in the Journal of Family Medicine and Primary Care. Okay, it took a look at the effect of artificial sweeteners on what is called HOMA IR. So the homeostasis model assessment estimate of insulin resistance. What that figure is, is it's basically looking at how much insulin is required in a person's body to maintain glucose homeostasis, to maintain a balance of stable glucose. So more HOMA IR means more insulin is required to maintain stable glucose indicating more potential insulin resistance. So this was interesting data. They found that those that consume artificial sweeteners were more prone to insulin resistance. So those that were consuming more in the way of like sucralose, saccharin, aspartame, acesulfame, potassium, were having more severe insulin resistance and those that consumed it for a longer period of time had even more severe insulin resistance. Does that mean that's causation? No, but it's certainly correlation and it's worth looking at. So again, very individual, and especially in the world of like low carb, if you're really trying to mitigate insulin resistance a little bit more, you just need to be aware of it. Test your glucose, test things, look at things. So the two ways that it could be affecting us is possibly a cephalic insulin response, which is like the body's like pre preemptive like response with insulin when it tastes something sweet, but that's usually pretty negligible. The more viable situation might be gut dysbiosis, which is so bio-individual, it's not even funny. Whereas like you're affecting your gut microbiome to affect the short chain fatty acids that can play a role in glucose metabolism. Different gut microbiome means different processing of nutrients, but it's so ambiguous. We cannot say with certainty. So sucralose in some studies has shown an insulin spike in humans. Okay, so we have that. Then we have uh, saccharin, which has been mixed. So we've seen kind of both. And then we've seen like acesulfame potassium, which has demonstrated an insulin spike in rats, but not necessarily in humans. So it's all over the board. So just exercise caution. This next one is really intriguing. It's caffeine, but what the heck? Here's the thing. Caffeine can trigger a fight or flight response, which can trigger us to have a spike in blood glucose to help fuel that fight or flight response. But the additional things like the cyclic adenosine monophosphate spike that we get out of it, which is beneficial. We also get some uh, phosphodiesterase, phosphodiesterase inhibition, which can help us a lot in terms of fat loss and in terms of just general health and well-being. But we also have an increase in adenopectin, which can protect us from insulin resistance. So caffeine's not really bad, even though you might have a little glucose spike, because the increase in adenopectin can protect us from insulin resistance that can occur from such a spike. That being said, really the long data with small amounts of caffeine doesn't really show big spikes in glucose that last for a long period of time. But there was a study published in the journal Diabetes Care that found around four or 500 milligrams of caffeine per day could increase glucose levels quite significantly throughout the course of the day. So it is dose dependent. So if you go over that 400 milligram mark, exercise some caution and take a look at your glucose and pay attention. So just to recap, parsnips, sneaky, sneaky parsnips, instant oatmeal, not necessarily regular oatmeal, ramen noodles or even pho noodles that have been heated, you know, especially ones that are heated super hot. Okay. Then we have fruit juice, definitely be careful there. Then we have, of course, the artificial sweeteners that you just need to bio-individually be looking at. And then of course we have the caffeine, last but not least. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel and I'll see you tomorrow.